this is really such a treat. It's not very often that you get to introduce a national treasure. And uh, <laughs> here he is. He's a bona fide national treasure. So Michael Morpoego, the author of about 130 books. I think he's not entirely sure himself how many he's written, but many of which have been adapted for stage and television, as I'm sure you will know, including War Horse, the book that made him a household name. He started out as a teacher, and with his wife, Claire, he set up the charity Farms for City Children, which has given over 90,000 children in the last 40 years the experience of spending time in the countryside. He also helped to set up the post of Children's Laureate with his friend Ted Hughes, and he was the third writer to hold the post. In 2018, he was knighted for his services to literature and charity, so he is an official knight errant. Um, and we are here today to talk about his wonderful new novel, uh, Boy Giant. So, Michael, thank you so much for you, coming Stephanie. to join us. Thank you. Let's start with the, the, the starting point for this story, because there's so much to talk about around it. What was the beginning point for this book? Was it the, the historical work of literature that it's based on, or the contemporary resonance that we're going to talk about later on? Well, the story, Swift's story, came first, obviously. I grew up with it like a lot of kids did, didn't, never read the whole thing like most kids don't. You just read the bit about Lilliput because it's the fun bit about the little people. And that's, that's what I learned when I was little. Then I have a wonderful colleague called Michael Foreman who illustrates my books often. And at some point, 25 years ago, he said, Michael, we've got to do Gulliver's, Tra Gulliver's Travels. You've got to do it, you've got to do it. So I said, well, no, because it's been done and done and it's you know, Lilliput and it's little people. And you know, fine. And uh, I tried to put him off. And it's, I succeeded until two years ago. And two years ago, he said, Michael, we still haven't done uh, Gulliver's Travels. And I said, it's still about little people and a, and a giant who wears you know, big shoes with silver buckles. And um, I know. And, and then, and then, and then, I started making strange connections. All of us will remember seeing images on our televisions of dead children being carried along beaches, whether it's in, whether it's in Greece or Turkey or wherever. And we know how that sears the soul and you don't forget it, but the trouble is you do forget it because something else comes along that's more important and blocks all that off. And it's, there is nothing more important. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe Swift wrote that story originally because he was having a go at the society around him, which he very much disapproved of. Well, I very much disapprove of our society. And I was thinking to myself, I don't think Swift would mind if I took some of his story and brought it into our time, and I had the, instead of the Gulliver washed up on the beach being a sailor from that time, in that history, uh, an Afghan refugee washed up on a beach. And it's on a beach of Lilliput of today, which hundreds of years ago had been visited by this Gulliver, who had warned the people of Lilliput that if you go down the route that my civilization is going down, you will be embroiled in wars and corruption. Don't do it. And they had evolved on this island, in my mind's eye, a way of living, which was not Shangri-La, it was just a way of living which the, the essential principle underlying is that you look after each other. That's finally what it is. So I thought of doing this, and then I went to a bookshop in Paris, which many of you have been will have been to. And my granddaughter works there. And my granddaughter gave me a badge, which I was very struck by. It said this. It's um, written, I believe, by George Whitman, who was the person who helped found the shop many, many years ago. Be not inhospitable to strangers, lest they be angels in disguise. And I thought, OK, that is the, going to be the theme of my book. So. It's a strange sort of book. It's a risky sort of book, but I thought, go for it. Well, it, it's an interesting mix, this book, because um, it is, in the way of Gulliver's Travels, there is a lot of satire in there, and it's very funny in places, but it is also kind of deeply heartrending, as it would be when you're dealing with the story of, of child refugees. Um, but to go back to the satire, tell us a bit about the, um, the egg wars of Lilliput, because I can't help feeling, uh, you're talking about this ridiculous, absurd conflict that has divided families and divided people and divided an entire 
uh, population from each other over such small, absurd differences. I, I can't help feeling there's some sort of parallel that, that, uh, yes. that you're aiming for here. Yes, it's not terribly subtle, is it? Um, <laughs> the truth is that, um, well, I'm a war baby. I was born in 1943. I remember nothing of the war, but I do remember the aftermath of the war. Uh, I finally, in a strange sort of way, uh, decided after a while that I had to prove myself in that world. I went into the army. I did all sorts of funny ways of arriving at where I arrived. And what I discovered after a while, which is what I think a lot of people discovered, is that um, wars are fought over extraordinarily small things which are made to grow into big things. Now, whether that be religion or the way we govern ourselves or our history or whatever, so much of it can be sorted out by sitting down and talking. And in the end, of course, it always is unsatisfactorily, but nonetheless, it's sorted out. So it seems to me to be part of what this society in Lilliput has done. It's worked out that you don't quarrel with your neighbours, and they have got, as you've read the story, you know, they have got a neighbour who is threatening, and they don't go back and threaten back. What they try to do is to talk it through and talk it through. It doesn't necessarily work, but they go on doing it. So, in, yes, I wanted to make that, that point fairly starkly that it's a silly world that goes to war. It's also a very tragic world that goes to war. You talk about your own childhood during the war, and I know you've, you've talked about how disruptive the war was to your own family. Do you think that's why you, it's something that you want to return to in Stories for Children, in a, to, to look at the way that these kind of conflicts can be so disruptive for children who perhaps don't understand the wider context? I would never, never think I'm writing for children at all. I write for me, selfishly. I mean, I write because I'm interested in the subject. I want to tell a story. I'm a story maker. In a sense, I don't care who reads the book. I hope people do, lots of people, but I don't care that, about their age at all. I don't think when I'm telling a story, this is for a 10-year-old or an 11-year-old, because the minute you do that, you patronize your audience. You're, you start talking down to them. And we know just from the last few days what children can do, what they are thinking about, how seriously they take the world. You patronize them at your peril. And I've, I've always known that. I've known that as a, when I was a child, and when I was a father, and I've been a teacher. So I've sort of known it in all sorts of, from all sorts of points of view. And I think it's really important as a writer that you don't do that. You don't just think, well, actually, they just like funny stuff or vulgar stuff. Yeah, of course they like that, and that's fine. And they've got that. But you must tell the stories you want to tell. And I tell the stories about the world as I see it, and I don't pretend. I look children in the eye and I tell them how I think it is. I may be wrong, but I'm just telling them that. And they get that. They quite like, I think, the honesty of someone who just sort of says it. They don't have to agree with it. I don't want them to agree with it, but I want them to think about it. But the most important thing when you finish the book is that you come away doubting. Not that you come away because you found some great belief. You come away thinking about it, dreaming about it. That's why I've gone on and on and on about stories in schools endlessly not being taught to the test, that we don't just do it for a comprehension test or a punctuation test. The last primary school I taught at, we had a wonderful head teacher who used to say to us, you finish the school day um, every day from three o'clock to half past three, you tell them or you read them a story, and you do not ask a single question about it. You just let them go out of school with this story in their head. And that seems to me to be so important, not to deliver solutions to children, but to deliver questions. So I never, never write for children. I'm not sure why I blurted all that out. It's because you suggested I, I was writing or thinking about the children, I think, which of course I do. I mean, it'd be silly to say I don't think about them. I tell you what I do, I write about them. So the hero in my story, this story, as in all of them, is a child, and that's important, or young people, they don't have to be a child. So for instance, in War Horse, if we must mention that, um, it's not about a child, it's about a horse, but it's also about a young boy, and it's about the young boys who went off to that war on all sides, but it is about essentially young people. When you say that this one is a is a risky book, do you mean in the sense that you're you're putting questions into children's minds, or that you are countering certain narratives that perhaps people might have heard regarding refugees or the way that refugees are, are regarded? I think if you put your head above the parapet about anything to do with migrants and refugees, you're asking for people to have a go at you, and particularly if that book is going to go into the classroom. Um, and I understand that. It is, it is deeply, currently controversial. 
but all the more important to write about it. That's what I, I mean, the thing is these children, these children see this stuff, you know, they, they see it as, sometimes as much as we do. They have it on their tablets, they have it on their phones, they see these images, they have seen that child being carried along a beach. This is not something that's reserved for adults. They see it and they have a response, they have thoughts about that. And it seems to me if you are writing stories that you know are going to be read by children, you have to engage with what it is that they are engaging with in the real world. Because the complexity of growing up now is, is unbelievably more difficult than when I was little. I mean, if I can't, many people here are not that old, I'm glad to say, but if I could, I'd take you back to 1947, 1948. It wasn't a, a perfect life, a great life. It was a much simpler life. Your parents did not have to guard against this and that all the time. You, what did you do? You either played out or you played in, and maybe you listened to the radio. They prevented you from finding out about the wicked world out there, either down the street or in foreign places. They didn't bring that because they thought you couldn't understand it, and they're probably right about certain things. And so you grew up much more slowly. Not It was not idyllic, but you grew up much, much more slowly. And sometimes you didn't talk about things because they supposed, and I think they were a little bit right, not completely right, but they supposed that there are certain things that are too traumatic to keep going on about. So I came from a family which had been, there was a divorce in the family. My mother met someone else during the war and there was a divorce just after the war. I was completely unaware of it, except that my name I knew as I was growing up was not my name. And that perplexed me. I did have another name, but it took me until about the age of 10 to discover what that name was. And I didn't meet my father till I was in my 20s, mostly because things were hidden. I don't blame anyone for that. That was just how people were then. The problem here now, I think, with these children is that nothing is hidden. It's all out there and they've got to deal with it. Whether it's the stuff at home or the stuff out there, they have to deal with it. And so their books, their stories, their plays, their music, their dance, everything has to reflect the complexity of that. We kind of tie it all up and put a little pink ribbon about it and, 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 and just say, well, it'll have a happy ending, it'll be all right. That's patronising them. Yeah, I suppose that's what I was getting at when I was thinking about when you write about issues that, or, you know, subject matter that is potentially distressing or difficult yes. and, and writing about that, knowing that your books are going to be read by yeah. children. Do you have to sort of come at it from a particular angle and think this is the kind of sensitivity I have to bring to this because I want children to to understand these issues and be aware of it without being overly kind of distressed or, or traumatized? Yes, you do. But I think it has to be almost subconscious. The minute you do think about it, then you will do this patronizing thing. I, I think that the lucky thing for me is that I've, I was a child, I remember, but I was also a father, a young father, and uh, now a grandfather and a great-grandfather. So I've dealt a lot with children in terms of how to talk to them. Yeah. And then I was this school teacher, and I engaged with them. I would tell them my, my own stories, and I would take them as far as I thought they could go without it being um, in any way traumatizing. But I would tell it hard. If there was something I felt that was important, then I wouldn't hold back. I can give you an example of this, really. I've, I've, there's been a play of Warhorse on for some time now, which I've been to far too often, but I've been to it. And one of the wondrous things about it, apart from the fact that it's an extraordinary production, is watching an audience come out afterwards. Um, and how the play has affected different generations in the same family. So you'll have eight-year-olds coming without out with their fathers and mothers, with their grandmothers and grandfathers. And they've all brought their lives to this story. It's the same story, but they've all brought their life experiences to it. And it sort of tells me that if you can write a story that does have some kind of universality, then, then maybe that's wonderful. And the National Theatre made it better than the book. It is broader than the book. The characters are more interesting in many, many ways. Um, but the idea is the same. I think you know, really on the same sort of lines, one of the recurring themes in all of your work, really when it comes down to it, it's about empathy. It's about wanting yeah. people to understand what someone else's experience might be like and what might lead that person to do the things that they do. Yeah. Even if that's a, a person who is particularly unkind or not, you know, it's yeah. always about trying to recognize um, that, I think. And was that something that was 
a driving force for you when you started writing, that idea of wanting to communicate and wanting children or wanting your readers in particular to think about different people's experiences outside of their well, own? Isn't that what all literature is about finally? I mean, if it's worth anything, it is this extraordinary way it enables us to understand the lives of others and the places of others. It takes you places where you've never been. If you are young, you could live as an old person. If you're female, you can live as a male. You, you, you find out so much more about the world, which you cannot do in your own life to start with. As you grow up, you can explore it more and more, but you can explore it in literature from a very young age um, in an extraordinary way. And I find that the whole business of being able to think yourself into other situations um, and know that there's a, there are other lives out there that for some time within a book are absolutely as important as your own. And when you discover, you discover how other people think, what other people believe, that seems to me to be critical about our, our whole education. If we, if we have people leaving school, whether they live at 16 or 18 or whatever, and they don't understand more about other peoples than themselves outside their city, outside their country, outside their continent, then we're, we're heading for an even bigger mess than we're in at the moment. The prime reason for having education, as far as I'm concerned, is knowledge and its understanding. Both together, they go side by side. Well, it's been wonderful, actually, about coming at this festival. I was sitting in the tent earlier on. And when you go to some festivals, all you do is talk to other writers. Boring. <laughs> but when you come here, I've met already musicians. I've met scientists. And it's this kind of thing. If you, if you are reaching out with the people that you meet, either in real life or in books, that's the way you discover and go on discovering. And to give children the idea that this is the way you find out about the world about you, about your place in it. And books can really do that. For life, they can do that. And if part of the journey is one of my books, then that pleases me. I can't tell you how much it pleases me sometimes to get a letter from um, a teacher who writes and says, I was reading, I don't know, the butterfly lion to uh, the children. And I couldn't finish it. I was in bits. I was in tears. And this kid put up her hand and said, I'll finish it for you, miss. And how wonderful it is for a child to see that a grown-up, particularly a grown-up they respect and admire, is touched by a book, that moved by a book. I mean, I was read to by my mum. She was an actor, very beautiful as all mothers are, and had a wonderful reading voice. And she'd read to me, I don't know, Walter de la Mer, Kipling, all sort of poems that people... Stevenson. Stevenson was my favourite. And she'd read me these poems, but read them in a way which was passionate. I knew she loved them, and she was passing on that love. And when you have letters, you know a teacher's been doing that, or a parent's been doing that, and the children have responded, then you think, well, actually, it's worthwhile. It's worthwhile writing. I'll write another book. Do you think it's becoming even more, I mean, obviously it's, it's even more critical now that we encourage children to, to think outside of their own understanding and to, to try and empathise with other lives. And this is happening at a time when the arts are being cut back and back in schools and it's getting harder and harder to bring children those experiences of yeah. art and literature. What would you advocate as a, <laughs> a solution to bringing that back into the classroom? Well, you never close another library, that's for sure, ever. Um, that should be the rule of any government come in, not just to not close them, but to make them better and open up new ones. If you want literature to be for everyone, it's got to be free at the point of delivery, like the health service. It cannot be something you just, if you can afford it, you buy it at Waterstones. It has to be free. It's for everyone. It's our, it's our right, it's our heritage. And uh, I feel that very, very strongly. And unless it is for everyone, then this kind of education is for everyone, then, then we are going down the tubes. It's really important that we, we cling to the culture that we've got and we enhance it and enhance it and i know everyone in this room this tent knows that if you see how people are taken by wonderful music by a great story and taken to other places and what they are learning from it and how it widens you and deepens your life and enriches you for the rest of your life this is not about and the problem is that people see it as outcomes all the time you know you close the library well what does that matter you can get it online well you can't you know and I think that the, the people who are doing that are just taking a short way, really, to, is to impoverish our children in a way that's just as important as not giving them enough vitamins, you know? It's really important. You've, um, I mean, the, the success of your books has allowed you to have a, a public platform where you, you've not shied away from voicing opinions that have been 
that, that are sometimes controversial. I wonder if that was a role you ever sort of sought out or thought that you would have as a kind of public advocate for literature and, and for the importance of the arts. No, I never did. I mean, when I was a teacher, you were limited, of course, to your classroom and to doing what you could there. But I certainly realised after I'd written a story or two, and one or two of them have been widely read, the first thing I recognised was that there was an internationalism about this that I responded to. When the books got translated, and I found myself talking about books in, in, in Israel, in, in, in France, in, in, in Palestine, uh, in Australia, and you realise that literature was this wonderful, wonderful way of connecting with people. I thought, well, that's worth not just writing books for, but talking about. And I think bit by bit by bit, as I got older, I think, well, you actually have a responsibility to speak out and say what you think. And since I, again, this might ring true with some people in this room, you get, do get to an age where you don't care what people think anyway. You know, I really don't care. I think what I think. I hope it's going to not hurt people's feelings to say what I think. But the most important thing is to say it, to speak it out, not to be silent when you know something is not right. So w tell us a little bit about when you set up the Children's Laureate role. W was that a part of an extension of that idea of the idea that writers should have a public platform and should children's writers should be more visible? No, it was because I had too much to drink one night. Um, <laughs> I had a great neighbour in Ted Hughes. He was down the road and we used to have quite a lot of good meals together and good wine together. And one night I was bemoaning after two or three glasses of really nice um, Chateau Neuf du Pape. I said to him something like, you're the something poet laureate. I think we should have a children's laureate because people need to speak more about the importance of literature for children because it is important and valuable. And he said, well, actually, you're right that I am as pleased or not pleased with the books that I've written for young people as the ones I've written for adults. They're, they're all important. Yes, good idea, Michael. Um, let's make a list of the people we need to talk to. He was very like that. Right? And so we had another glass of wine and we wrote down names of important people to go and see to make it work. Anyway, a year later, sadly, sadly, he was dead. But a year later, we had our first children's laureate. that was Quentin Blake. The reason for the whole thing really was this, that there has been, and there still is, this feeling that if it's for children, it's not that important. Uh, it's been there in our society for a very long time. People demean them put them to one side, say, well, yeah, they don't know much, they're only young, they'll grow up. And it's all right if it's good enough for children. The wonderful thing, for instance, about what the National Theatre has been doing and the Royal Shakespeare Company now have been doing in terms of their productions for young people and for families is that they brought the best of British theatre for children. When you bring the best, whether it's the best writers, the best illustrators, and that's what we felt at the time, that if you make great books, good books, and they are there for children, and it has prestige in the society, you do have these books reviewed and spoken about. And have your champions, well, call them laureates, call them what you like, but have champions who can get up there and speak up for children and their rights to have good book to read. It was very much about that. We were quite, it wasn't just the wine, we were quite passionate about it. Ted Hughes all the time was trying to enable young people to write. He wrote a wonderful book, some of you will know it, called Poetry in the Making which was his invitation to young people to pick up a pen and, and, and write. It's the best book I know through that. And, and it interested him that you had to reach out to children and find what it was that they had as a talent in there somewhere. And he always said, you, we, are all, we all have a story to tell. We all have the poet inside us. Most of us never get to the point where we have the confidence to write it down. And this was his invitation. Come on, you can do this, you can do this. And I spent most of my life trying to say the same thing to children. I wonder if you can tell us just a little bit about your Farms for Children project, and then I yeah. know you've got... Farms for Steady Children, it's my wife's idea. It's wonderful how these things start, and they start as a child. When she was seven, she had a rather wonderful father who was a publisher called Alan Lane, who started Penguin Books. Mm -hmm. And he, she was the eldest daughter, and she was a pain. And I think during the holidays, the family decided that let's let Claire go somewhere where she's no trouble. And they had a friend who kept a pub in Devon. And they sent her down to have her holidays in Devon. And she was seven, eight years old. And she was in the middle of this countryside, staying in a pub. It's very bizarre. And Auntie Peggy, she was called, um, didn't like her having her around under her feet too much. So sent her out every morning. Put on your wellies, Claire, go out. And she would spend her day going out, walking the countryside. At a time when there weren't many cars and people weren't saying, don't talk to strangers. 
it wasn't that world, it was a different world, and she just went out there and explored it in her wellies. And she found out about nature. She was very close to the ground, so she found her first slow worm and her first lizard. I'm afraid she kept them rather too long, some of them, but we won't go there. Uh, she just became fascinated by everything that lived and crawled and flew. And then she'd walk up a lane and she'd meet farmers and they'd say, come and groom the horses or come and feed the calves. And she became really in love, I suppose, with that particular countryside. Ted Hughes called it down the deep lanes. He called them deep lanes. Huge, great high. You can't see where you're going at all. Anyway, she loved it. So, luckily for her, she married me later on. She was a teacher by this time. I was a teacher by this time when we both came to the conclusion that you can only teach children so much inside a school. The children we were concerned about needed to broaden their horizons, needed to have the same wonderfully rich experience she had had. And she said, let's start this, this charity. We'll call it Farm Subsidy Children. Her daddy, his, Anna Nain, had just died and left her some money. So bought a large house and a farm with a partner, a uh, farming partner, and we started and invited the first children down from Birmingham. And now we've had a th close on 100,000 children come in for the last 47 years from Birmingham, Bristol, Manchester, all over. There's kids down there now. I saw them before I left yesterday. And they come and they live, come for a week with their teachers, 35, 40 of them, live on the farm, work on the farm, and they go back having had the experience of a lifetime. They haven't loved it all. They, they have to walk when it's cold, when it's rain, they have to collect in hay when it's hot. They do all that's possible within the bounds of safety. So it's a way of extending their horizons, really. That's what it is. And we've loved it. It's given an enormous amount of in inspiration to me, a lot of joy to her. So it's very selfish, and we've loved doing it. Is that experience and what that's given you, has, do you think that that has informed the way you write about animals so often and the relationship between yeah. children and animals? And I've had a really lucky and almost perhaps a unique experience of living and working with kids for certainly 30 years of my life out on a farm day in, day out. I milk cows with them, I move sheep with them. We do all these extraordinary things together and I've watched these children, observed them, how they get on with animals and how the animals get on with them. The book War Horse really came from one child from Birmingham um, who came down, it's called Billy. Teachers warned me, it's a school that came and came and they, they trusted me and I trusted them. They said, Michael, please don't ask Billy direct questions. He hates direct questions because it means he's got to speak and he doesn't speak. He hasn't spoken for two years at this school and he will run away from Devon back to Birmingham. He runs out away all the time. You mustn't, you mustn't do it. So I said, fine, I'll leave him be. And I watched this Billy all week and he did, did the work. He was wonderful with the animals. He was very connected to the animals. He clearly had a great feeling, no fear at all. But he would not talk to anyone. None of his friends, teachers, and I didn't even try to answer the question. I did what I was told. Towards the end of the week, I used to go up and read him a story in the evening, on the last evening they were there. And I walked into the yard on a dark November night. Billy was there in the, on the outside step in the yard by the stables. He was in his pyjamas, it was pouring with rain, and he had his slippers on. And I was about to shout at him to go back indoors when he suddenly started talking to this horse. Hebe, she was called. And he had his hand up and he had his hand on her nose and was talking very quietly. And I stood where he couldn't see me the shadows around the corner, but I listened and he told that horse what he'd done on the farm that day. So I ran round, fetched the teachers, brought them back. I said, look, 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 look. This is, he talks, he talks. So somehow this animal, this wonderful Hebe, had unlocked whatever it was, was holding his tongue, freezing his tongue. And he was speaking and he just talked and talked and talked. And the teachers were amazed. I was amazed, and what it convinced me was that there is this connection between children and animals, which is elemental, which is not sentimental, and it enabled me to go sit down afterwards and go and write a story about a horse that, I suppose, can write a book and understands other people in different languages and their touch and their comfort and their love and their trust because I'd seen all that with this boy. So it massively influenced my life as a writer because I'd had these insights which went on day after day after day and then insights into myself as well. Wonderful. And just before we go to audience questions, I know mm. you want to tell us about another charity that you're involved with. Yeah, I just thought it was important to talk about it. I don't know if any of you have seen this, this flag. Um, it's designed by the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei and it, 
a group of really, I think they're theatre people mostly, all over the world, this country too, have got together. It's called Fly the Flag. And it's because all of us feel at the moment that human rights are under threat. They're either being ignored or they're actually under threat. And we want to fly the flag for human rights. And Ai Weiwei went and took the footprint of a, of a refugee in the sand and made this flag. And I just wanted you to see it. But it's very important to me because it seems to me that it's the great freedom that we seem to be losing at the moment. A sense of these rights that we've got, that children have got them, we've got them, and we take them for granted at our peril. I mean, what I want is in 10, 20 years' time that this flag is up there like the peace flag and the people understand it's for our rights and people suffered and died over hundreds of years for this and we still haven't achieved what we should have achieved anyway. That's what I thought I'd tell you. So I'm, it's something I'm passionate about at the moment. And, and it's a wonderful piece of art. I didn't do that myself, I promise. That's Ai Weiwei. <laughs> and it's really what this book is also it all about. It happens to come at the yeah. same time as this book, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michael, for all your wonderful words this afternoon. Um, can I thank, thank my you. wonderful interviewer as well? Could you give her a huge hand, please? Thank you for coming. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.